British Columbia, Canada, June 16, 1811. Aboard the American fur ship known as the Tonquin, fur trader James Lewis lies below deck, mortally wounded. His breathing is labored, and he strains to listen to the native warriors that are just now pulling their long dugout canoes up next to the hulking vessel. He does not know their language, and thus, he does not know what they are saying. But he knows why they are here, and James Lewis knows what is about to happen. The chilly waters that surround the vessel situated in Cleoquit Sound were seemingly empty just minutes ago. Now, they seem to swarm with war canoes, dozens of them, filled with angered Cleoquot warriors. Soon, the plodding of moccasined footsteps begins to cause a low rumble, as if a thunderstorm is brewing somewhere far away. Lewis begins to feel sick, the noxious effects of his physical state and his psychological distress. But his resolve remains steady. His gaze drops momentarily, and he stares blankly into the room full of gunpowder kegs outside of which he lies, propped up against one of the sturdy wooden walls of the ship. He again studies the line of dark powder stretching from his position into the room. He is tired. The night before had been the longest of his still young life, in which his thoughts had drifted from his current situation to his family and friends at home, whom he knows he will never see again. He had also had much time to ponder the events of the previous few days, and just how he had come to be here, alone, below decks of this expensive and well-traveled ship. Lewis had been part of a crew of American, French, Canadian, and native fur traders under the employ of the legendary business and real estate mogul, John Jacob Astor. They had traveled to this distant locale in the hopes of trading with the natives for the valuable beaver pelts that were at this time in the 19th century, a highly profitable commodity. For the next few days, they had anchored offshore of these idyllic lands and bartered a number of profitable trades with the locals. Though the men on board the Tonquin and the local Cleoquiat had respective origins thousands of miles away from each other, they were well aware of each other's existence. Though America as a nation extends only to the Mississippi River at this point in the early 19th century, the American fur trade is a globalized industry. The fashionable beaver felt stovepipe hat at this time is all the rage in Europe as well as the more cosmopolitan urban centers in America. Cafes, parlors, and street corners are all replete with young men sporting their most stylish new headgear. In what might be considered both the height of irony and a wonder of a worldwide supply chain, it is the fashionable fancies of the European upper classes that drive the day-to-day -day lives and livelihoods of people more than half a world away. Throughout the entirety of North America, fur trappers roam the rivers and streams, hoping to ensnare the valuable animals in their steel traps and send their bounties out to market by way of St. Louis or Santa Fe. And on the open seas, American vessels routinely made the treacherous journey around Cape Horn and up the west coast of North America to the Pacific Northwest, where they traded for furs with local natives. Within a few decades' time, the entire system would implode, as changing fashions and waning beaver populations would prove too much for the market to bear. However, in 1811, there is scarcely a more profitable trade on the whole of the continent, and men are driven to great lengths in their quests to build their fortunes. Perhaps most prominent among these men capitalizing on the fur boom is Johann Jakob Astor, better known as John Jacob Astor a German-born American immigrant who had capitalized on the Jay Treaty that was signed by the United States and Great Britain in 1794. The treaty opened new markets in the Great Lakes region as well as in Canada. Astor signed a contract with the Northwest Company based in Montreal. Astor would import the furs from Montreal to New York and then ship them to Europe to be purchased by hat manufacturers. By the turn of the 19th century, he had amassed a fortune of roughly $250,000, over $6 million by today's standards when accounting for inflation. However, in 1807, the U.S. Embargo Act was enacted by Congress, closing off trade with Canada and severely disrupting Astor's business dealings as his connections in Montreal were now illegal. In response, Astor obtained direct permission from President Thomas Jefferson to establish the American Fur Company, which he did in 1808. Over the next few years, Astor would use the American Fur Company, or AFC, as well as its subsidiaries, 
to gain control of virtually the entirety of the Great Lakes region, as well as secure several lucrative contracts. Intending to hamper his former employer in the Northwest Company, as well as the juggernaut of the industry in the Hudson's Bay Company, Astor soon began to finance expeditions to the Pacific Northwest in hopes of monopolizing the fur trade with the natives there before his rivals could gain a foothold. This had been the driving force behind Astor's purchase of the Tonquin. In 1810, Astor created the Pacific Fur Company, a subsidiary of the American Fur Company, to expand into the Northwest with intentions to both explore the territory and to establish favorable relations with the natives. Astor had purchased the Tonquin, a 290-pound bark, 96 feet in length, and outfitted to carry 22 cannons from the Fanning and Coles Company, who had sailed the ship to China to trade for cheap goods in 1807. Astor purchased the vessel for $37,860, roughly $700,000 today, on August 23, 1810. He hired the most experienced fur traders he knew, mostly Scottish and French-Canadian voyageurs, who had long plied their arduous trades amongst the natives of the Great Lakes region. And to command the ship, Astor sought out the services of a short-tempered and staunchly disciplined ex-U.S. Navy captain named Jonathan Thorne. Born in Schenectady, New York on January 8, 1779, he was the first of 15 children born to Samuel and Helena Horn. He became a midshipman in the U.S. Navy at age 21 in April of 1800. Thorne participated in the Tripolitan War, also known as the First Barbary War, in 1801. Thorne was part of a small group of volunteers that accomplished the dangerous mission of sneaking into the harbor at Tripoli, Libya, and destroying the captured American frigate known as the Philadelphia on February 16, 1804. On August 3rd of that same year, Thorne also participated in the attack on Tripoli Harbor led by Commodore Edward Preble. He was commended for his conduct during the engagement and was given command of one of the captured gunboats. While serving in the New York Navy Yard, he was promoted to the rank of full lieutenant in February 1807. At the time, Thorne was the youngest naval officer to ever command a United States Naval Yard. Still, despite his relatively rapid ascension within the ranks of the Navy, Thorne's correspondence to friends and family at the time betray a young man internally besieged by self-doubt and various physical ailments. Thorne would serve in the Navy until 1810, when he was granted a two-year furlough in order to sign on with John Jacob Astor for a job as captain of the Tonquin. But as much as Astor's thought processes were logical, he would simply hire the best, most experienced men he could for each position, they lacked an overall accounting for the variability of human temperaments, perspectives, and experiences. And unfortunately for the men embarking on the Tonquin, there were scarcely two cultures more at odds than that of Captain Thorne's disciplined navy and that of the purely pragmatic, often romanticized voyageurs. The Tonquin set sail from New York City on September 8, 1810, carrying a crew of 34 men. They rounded Cape Horn and stopped off in Hawaii before arriving at the mouth of the Columbia River on the 22nd of March, 1811. During the entirety of the journey, Captain Thorne had proven increasingly at odds with the voyageurs. They found him wildly overbearing, while he found them slothful and disorganized. Thorne saw his obedience to the orders of Astor as his primary responsibility, while the voyageurs viewed themselves as skilled and knowledgeable tradesmen who had hired on for a job they intended to do well. However, they had no intentions nor inclinations to adhere to what they saw as the captain's overly strict policies and timelines. En route to the Pacific Northwest, Thorne's adherence to schedule was tested beyond what he considered to be reasonable bounds. On December 4, 1810, when the Tonquin had pulled into Port Egmont and the Falkland Islands in order to gather supplies and make minor repairs, eight men had ventured into the interior of the islands in hopes of procuring more provisions. When they proved slightly tardy on their return, Thorne saw fit to sail away with the remainder of the crew and leave the eight men stranded on the remote island. Desperate and with little other option, the eight men struck out desperately in their rowboat in hopes of catching up with the Tonquin. After six exhausting hours, the men in the rowboat managed to come within sight of the Tonquin. One of the crewmen, a man named Robert Stewart, 
threatened to kill the captain should he not turn around to rescue the men and the rowboat. Thorne, rightfully taking the threat quite seriously, obliged to steward in his cohort's demands, and the eight crewmen were subsequently rescued. While Thorne had seen the action as a necessary imposition of discipline, the trappers and crewmen, who were not military men, saw it as a dishonorable and wholly condemnable action. Thorne, for his part, had become increasingly frustrated with the laissez-faire attitude of the fur traders. He found the jovial atmosphere they created as inappropriate, dismissive, and even dangerous. By the time the Tonquin sailed into the waters of Hawaii's Kaleakua Bay on the 12th of February 1811, the crew and the captain were seemingly irreparably at odds. Though he was a stalwart disciplinarian, Thorne did see the necessity in maintaining at least some semblance of cordiality between himself and the crew. So, while in Hawaii, Thorne finally made a temporary peace between himself and the senior partner fur traders. Thorne recruited 24 Hawaiian Kanaka laborers to assist in the day-to-day -day work that awaited the crew of the Tonquin upon their arrival in the Pacific Northwest. The Tonquin left Hawaii behind on March 1, 1811. Three weeks later, on March 22, 1811, the ship came into sight of its most formidable challenge yet, the Columbia River. Among the tasks that Thorne had been charged with by Astor was the building of a permanent trading post near the critical geographical point where the Columbia River pours into the Pacific Ocean. Even today, the swirling, raging waters of the area provide a daunting task for sailors in modern-day vessels to navigate. But Thorne was unmoved by the fearful sight of the violent, churning waters. His concern was only the task at hand. Thus, on a particularly stormy day, he ordered five men to cast out in a rowboat and make their way into the middle of the waters to sound the bottom or determine the depth of the water so that the larger ship could find a spot on the formidable sandbar deep enough for it to get through. The terrified men beseeched Thorn with heartfelt pleas for their lives, as they saw venturing into the turbulent waters before them as tantamount to suicide. J.C. Fox, a veteran Boston sailor and Thorne's first mate, was appointed to lead the task. He was ordered to take a crew composed of three French Canadians who had never been to sea before, and an aging Yankee sailor who would be of marginal use at the oars. He protested vociferously to the captain, who only dismissed the terrified young man by turning his back to him and remarking that if he was so afraid of water, he should have stayed in Boston. Thorne ordered them to carry on insisting that he needed all of his experienced sailors to man the ship in the midst of the repressive squall they were currently enduring. Ultimately, Fox mournfully obliged. He sorrowfully addressed his comrades, saying that his uncle had left his bones at the bottom of this channel only a year before, trying to make the treacherous crossing himself, and that now he would join him. It would be only minutes later when the boat would capsize amidst the waves, killing all five men on board. Three days later, on the 25th of March, 1811, another crew of five men was ordered to repeat the same mission that had killed their unfortunate comrades scarcely 48 hours earlier. Their small rowboat met the same fate, being capsized in short order amidst the crashing waters. However, this time, one American crew member and one of the Hawaiian Kanakas managed to miraculously make their way to shore after a horrifically harrowing ordeal that saw both nearly succumb to drowning and then hypothermia. The next day, the Tonkin was able to navigate past the sandbar, laying anchor in Baker Bay. Thorne and the remaining members of the crew then came ashore. Over the succeeding few weeks, the crew of the voyageurs and the remaining Hawaiians would construct a trading post. This post would blossom into an economic hub and is today the town of Astoria, Oregon. As they labored, much of the conversation amongst the men was conducted amongst themselves and their native tongues so as to be indiscernible to Captain Thorne. But it was clear to the captain, from their tone alone, that the crew were nearing a mutinous fervor. Still, the mission carried on. As the months passed, trade was carried out with curious locals, such as the Clatsop people, a Chinookan tribe that had been encountered by the Lewis and Clark expedition in 1805. Thorne pressed the Clatsop for information on any of their neighbors to the north who might be open to trading as well. He was referred to the Cleoquiot tribe, who resided around the Cleoquiot Bay some 430 miles to the north. The Cleoquiot, meaning the people from Cleoqua or Cleoqui, had recently engaged in peaceable trading with a number of European merchants. 
they were a hunter-gathering people, descendants of the Nunchanuls. Scant years before, in the late 1700s, they had engaged in prolonged and vicious intertribal warfare in efforts to rid their territories of foreign invaders from rival nations. Thorn was encouraged by the potential profit source and dismissive of any military threat that might be posed against his superiorly armed men aboard their state-of-the-art ship. And so, on June 5, 1811, the Tonquin again crossed the sandbar, leaving the waters of the bay and heading north again towards current-day Vancouver, British Columbia. As they traveled north, they stopped intermittently to come ashore and trade with other tribes along the way. During one of these stops, they hired a local native named Jose Kiao to serve as their interpreter as they continued on northward. Thorne was again cautioned against venturing into the Cleoquiat's territory as they had recently had some tense dealings with other European traders. Thorne, again, dismissed any threat posed by the natives paddling cedar canoes and wielding homemade war clubs against his mighty and well-armed vessel. During the second week of June, the Tonquin finally made its way into the waters of Cleoquiat Sound. Alexander McKay, the most experienced Scottish fur trader on board the ship, and Jose Akial went ashore to establish relations with the Cleoquiat. They were received peaceably, even being welcomed to stay the night in the chief's longhouse. The next day, as McKay and Jose Akial established trade on shore, a number of Cleoquiat canoes went out to the Tonquin in hopes of bartering for more goods than McKay and Jose Akial had brought with them. Before leaving to come ashore, McKay had cautioned Captain Thorne of this eventuality, and warned him not to let too many Cleoquiat on board at once. Thorne, wholly inexperienced in trading with natives save for his most recent dealings in the past few weeks, brushed McKay's concerns aside, again reassuring him that the Tonquin's might rendered it practically invincible to native attack. As curious Cleoquiat clambered on board, Thorne ordered several blankets spread out on deck and trade goods laid upon them. Believing himself a shrewd bargainer, Thorne attempted engaging a Cleoquiat elder, a chief known as Nukami, in trade. He offered two blankets, an assortment of beads, and a number of metal fish hooks in exchange for one otter pelt, an offer he felt to be more than charitable. Nukami, however, was an experienced and shrewd dealmaker, a veteran of countless dealings with Europeans and other natives throughout his long life. He rejected Thorne's offer outright, scornfully condemning it as egregiously low. Nukami insisted on five blankets. Thorne saw this as outright extortion. He angrily turned his back to the chief, stalking off towards his quarters. The chief, indignant himself, followed the captain, taunting him for being such a weak bargainer and waving the otter pelts in the air. Incensed, the captain grabbed one of the furs and, according to varying accounts, either struck the chief with it or rubbed it in his face, shouting, Damn your eyes! He subsequently threw Nukami and all of his cohorts off of the Tonquin and sent word from McKay and Hosea Kiao to return. McKay was horrified at the captain's pomposity and the experienced traders in the crew now all believed themselves to be in great danger. They insisted that now was the time for the Tonquin to pull up anchors and to take its leave, but Captain Thorne would hear none of it. Just after sunrise on the following morning, a singular canoe appeared on the water, pulling up next to the Tonquin. Captain Thorne, as well as much of the rest of the crew, was still asleep. The Cleoquiat inside the canoe held up furs and made overtures of peace towards the crewmen on watch, who were convinced to let the small ship come aboard. Captain Thorne, as well as McKay and Hosea Kiao, were summoned to the deck, and trading was commenced. But soon, more canoes began to flock to the Tonquin. At first, just a few, but then more, and then more. Again, McKay and Hosea Kiao beseeched Captain Thorne to only allow a small group of Cleoquiat on board at a time. Again, Thorne dismissed their concerns wholeheartedly. Hosea Kiao then noticed that many of the Cleoquiat warriors wore fur mantles draped over their necks and shoulders, a curious wardrobe choice considering the warm June weather. Yet again, the captain roundly condemned the idea of being caught off guard by a surprise attack. Finally, the number of Cleoquiat on board the Tonquin became unmanageable. And yet still, the canoes continued to pull up next to the Tonquin. Finally, Thorne was forced to order the decks cleared and the topsails unfurled, 
and the anchor, weighed. The mood on board the ship, and that of Thorn in particular, was rapidly devolving from one of joviality to one of panicked suspicion. As the preparations were being made to move, and the Clail Quiot were being ushered off the Tonquin and back into their canoes, James Lewis, acting as the ship's clerk, had been hunched down next to a bale of blankets, taking stock of inventory. Suddenly, a startling, bone-chilling war cry rang out, piercing the muggy summer air. The Cleoquiot chief standing next to Lewis brandished a large hunting knife, burying it deep into the unfortunate American's back. Lewis fell forward into the ship's companionway, alive but grievously wounded, and a massacre ensued on board the Tonquin. McKay, standing nearby, was the only crewman who had broken the typical policy which barred anyone from carrying arms above deck without explicit permission and snuck a pistol into his waistband. With the advent of the attack, McKay, the seasoned, strong-willed Scotsman, pulled the weapon and made use of its single shot in disposing a lone Cleoquiot warrior. The other warriors immediately leapt upon McKay, bludgeoning him mercilessly with the war clubs they had concealed beneath their furs. McKay was then tossed, barely alive, into a canoe where he was dispatched by Cleoquiot women with large oars. Next to fall was Thorn, who in fact fought valiantly and viciously with a pocket knife he kept on his person as he made a desperate bid to get to the cache of weapons kept on board. He managed to eviscerate four of his assailants, though he suffered several grievous wounds in the process. He too was soon felled by a mighty strike from a war club. The bulk of the pitiable crew on board were then cut and clubbed down over the next few minutes, as the Cleoquiot exacted their revenge for the captain's disrespect. Every sailor on the decks was killed, save for the native translator, Josea Kiao. Also still alive was James Lewis, who had dragged himself into the shadows and hidden for the remainder of the attack. Now satisfied, the Cleoquiot took what goods they fancied most and returned to their canoes, rowing across the placid, chilly waters as the imposing Tonquin now sat still with its crew cold in death. However, in a miraculous oversight, the Cleoquiot had overlooked the seven sailors who had climbed into the ship's rigging to unfurl the topmast. After the Cleoquiot made their exit, the sailors made their way to the deck and then below deck where they found the dying Lewis. Lewis, resigned to his fate, had told the remaining survivors to cast out in one of the rowboats and that he would stay behind. He burned for revenge against the Cleoquiot and sought to make his last act his retribution. He requested only that he be left with a line of gunpowder stretching from where he lay to the ship's powder magazine, which contained nearly 9,000 pounds of gunpowder. He would wait until they returned the next day, which all assumed to be a certainty, as there was still so much valuable loot left on board. Then he would blow the ship up. This, he hoped, would create time for his cohorts to escape and eliminate as many of their pursuers as possible. After jarring farewells, the men left Lewis alone with his thoughts as they slipped away in the rowboat. And now, here he sits, retching in pain and smiling to himself as the ship grows heavier and heavier with the weight of the Cleoquiot climbing on board. Before long, roughly 200 warriors swarm the deck and holes of the once mighty vessel, now but a carcass to be scavenged. Perhaps Lewis takes one last look at the brilliant British Columbia sky, or thinks once more of his upstate New York home, or the Hawaiian Islands, the Falklands, the bar rooms of New York City, or the beaches of Oahu. Then, as Jose Kial watches from the shore, unaware that there are any survivors at all, the Tonquin erupts in what is likely the largest explosion that will be seen in the Pacific Northwest until World War II's battle for the Aleutian Islands. A din of grief and horror erupt from the Cleoquiot assembled on shore as a giant fireball consumes what is left of the Tonquin within minutes. Not only is this a tragedy for the Cleoquiot, but the explosion has not served its secondary purpose in providing a distraction for the escaping sailors. According to Jose Aquial, they are soon blown to shore by a fierce gale and captured. In retribution for the killing of their tribesmen, the sailors are summarily tortured to death. It will be weeks later when word finally reaches Fort Astoria, 
passed on by reluctant natives who now seem to be inexplicably fleeing the area. Save for Hosea Kiao, who is now a prisoner of the Cleoquiat, there are no survivors. The entire crew of the Tonquin, as well as the ship itself, have been lost. Word will make its way to Aster, who will find himself much aggrieved, but more determined than ever, to establish a trading foothold in the territory. But the many tales of Aster's ambitions, as well as those of the plight of the peoples of the Pacific Northwest who will suffer untold hardships in the years to follow, are, for tonight, other stories for other times. Thank you for joining us on this episode of History at the OK Corral. Be sure to click the like button, share this episode with a friend, and become a subscriber. Also, if you'd like to support our work and gain early access to episodes, as well as ad-free viewing, you can become a member of this channel by clicking on the Join button or click the link below in the description to become a member on Patreon. Thank you again for watching, and we'll see you next time on History at the OK Corral, home of history's greatest shootouts and showdowns.